This episode of Paradigm Profiles is about Lorenzo Lencho Guzman, who coined the phrase, I am the general, I am the general. <laughs> this episode is about former Nuestra Familia member Lorenzo Guzman, aka Lencho from Westside Barrio Horseshoe. I've personally been knowing Lencho for well over 30 years now, and although we have our issues and there's reasons why I personally don't care for him, I'm not going to allow this to be a basis for any fabrication or embellishment when it comes to his true past or what happened throughout his own personal history. The one thing I will say about Lencho off the top is this. During our criminal careers as gang members, most of us have done our share of making sacrifices. We've put in work and we've endured our share of tribulation. It's just part of the game. But according to some of Lencho's own homeboys from Barrio Horseshoe, he never put in any work for his hood, nor was he ever known for putting in work on the streets. His whole claim to fame took place on July 4th, 1990, while he was attending an NF function at Kelly Park in San Jose with another NF member by the name of Victor Sleepers Escobel. The function was a barbecue that was put together by another fellow NF member, Jerry, Cripple Jerry Salazar, and his mother. The barbecue was nothing more than a roost and a cover to get all the members of the regiment together so that they could discuss street business and all the directives that were being passed down from NF leadership. At that time, the streets of San Jose were rich with NF members and coincidentally, there was a huge influx of NF and NR members who had all paroled and who had all been released from custody at around the same time. Another one of these individuals who was an up and coming NF member, Louis Dump Truck Chavez, had also been released and was in possession of a newly revised BNL, a bad news list. A copy of that list was passed on to Cripple Jerry, who at that time was the acting regimental commander for the San Jose Regiment. On the morning of the barbecue, Lancho, Dump Truck, and Sleepers just so happened to be the first three homeboys to arrive. When each of them arrived, they walked up to the barbecue area where Cripple Jerry, his mom, and some of his mom's friends were still hanging up some of the party decorations. Three picnic tables had been pushed together creating one huge table and some of Cripple Jerry's younger primas were organizing the food that they had cooked the night before. After extending each other their formal greetings, Lancho and Sleepers both grabbed a beer and then fell back onto one of the benches that was set up in their makeshift barbecue area. Suavecito by Malo was playing on one of the small boom boxes that was sitting on top of a cooler. Everyone seemed to be in good spirits. As more people began to arrive, what happened next was something that nobody would have expected. It came as a complete surprise. A very well-known individual by the name of Carlos Mejia showed up to the barbecue unannounced and uninvited. This was a blessing in disguise. As soon as Carlos walked up, Cripple Jerry immediately recognized him. He recognized him as being one of the many high priority targets that was documented on this newly revised BNL. The same BNL that Dump Truck had parole with. This hit list was composed and put together by Pinky and Panthera, who at the time were two high ranking members of the OGB, the organizational governing body. The whole purpose for putting this list together was not only because the San Jose Regiment needed to be reestablished, but more importantly because rumors had begun circulating that there were a lot of dropouts and NF hermits who had began to congregate out in the San Jose area. Dump Truck was recruited into the NF by Joseph Pinky Hernandez and Vincent Big Chante Arroyo in 1989 while he was housed in the shoe program at Tehachapi State Prison. Pinky and Chente had high expectations for Dump Truck. They had plans to not only appoint him as the regimental commander who would oversee the whole San Jose Regiment, but then they were also considering appointing him to act as a regimental administrator who would basically oversee most of the regiments in the Bay Area. When Carlos arrived, Cripple Jerry told him to grab a beer and to make himself something to eat. Even though this guy was an NF target, he didn't want to tip his hand or do anything to spook him. As Carlos was making himself something to eat, Cripple Jerry, who was in a wheelchair, 
rolled over to where Lancho and Sleepers were drinking and inconspicuously passed on the directives that they basically were already anticipating. Cripple Jerry told them to lure Carlos away from the barbecue and then to kill him. Sleepers, who was more than willing to put in some work, asked Cripple Jerry if he had a gun they could use for the hit or if he could have someone drop one off at the park. As the regimental commander, Cripple Jerry had access at regimental guns that he had stashed away at one of their safe houses. But at the time, he didn't think he had enough time for someone to go retrieve one and make it back to the park before possibly losing Carlos. As Cripple Jerry was contemplating on what to do next, he handed Sleepers a honey knife and told him, just use this and get rid of it when you're done. Lancho, who was just basically along for the ride, said or did nothing. He just waited for Sleepers to leave. Years later, when everything was said and done, I talked to Sleepers while we were in Pelican Bay and he personally told me that Lancho didn't do nothing that day and that he's a scary ass piece of shit. <laughs> Those were his words. He said Lancho acted like he just wanted to run and that Lancho wouldn't even hold Carlos when he was stabbing him. Sleepers basically carried out that hit by himself. The whole reason why Carlos was greenlighted was because one, he was collecting taxation money on behalf of the NF. He was apparently telling people he was an active C and that he was authorized to collect these proceeds by NF leadership in the Bay. And two, because Carlos allegedly sanctioned the murder of a C while he was in custody. One has to ask the question, how was this guy able to orchestrate the murder of an active C behind the walls? Trust me, the details of the murder were complicated but he basically played off the loyalty of a fellow Nordaniel and led him to believe that if he didn't act and move on the sea, that he was in danger of being killed himself. As they were getting ready to walk to the store, that song, In the Rain by the Dramatics, came on the radio and set the perfect mood for a Sunday barbecue. But today there'd be no barbecue, at least not for these three. After sleepers pounded back a few more cold ones and swooped up a half dozen street tacos, he invited Carlos and Lancho to accompany him to the 7-Eleven that was right down the street off of Keys and 12th Street. He told Carlos that they just needed to grab a few more things for the barbecue, including more charcoal and a couple more cans of lighter fluid. Sleepers told me that Lancho was acting paranoid the whole time they were walking and that he just kept acting like he wanted to let Carlos go. He said that Lancho told him that they could do it another time when they were better prepared and he kept telling sleepers that they couldn't do this shit in broad daylight, that they'd get busted. <laughs> Sound like Lancho didn't even want to participate. By the time they got to the 7-Eleven, sleepers said he already knew he was going to have to do this by himself and that he had to act quick because he was losing Lancho by the minute. Those were his words. And that's exactly what happened. When they got to the 7-Eleven, sleepers tried to create a distraction by asking Carlos if he could help him grab some cardboard boxes behind the store so they'd have a way to carry everything back. The ruse worked perfectly. Carlos bit hook, line, and sinker. He was completely clueless and unsuspecting insofar as what was about to come. Once sleepers boxed him in, he slid up on his blind side and had Carlos in a compromised position he struck. Sleepers grabbed a handful of Carlos's shirt and started sinking the blade all the way up until he was topping out the handle. By the time Carlos could react or mount any type of response, it was too late. He knew he was in trouble the minute Sleepers grabbed him and there wasn't much he could do about it. Whether Carlos went in the shock and passed out because he was losing blood or whether he started playing possum to save himself. Sleepers just kept on stabbing him until he stopped moving. When he was done, Sleepers rolled the knife up in a piece of newspaper and stuck it back in his waistband. Meanwhile, Carlos never moved again, which led both Lencho and Sleepers to believe that he was dead and that he had succumbed to his injuries. In fact, they were so confident that he had died that they actually facilitated a message to NF leadership in Tehachapi that confirmed Carlos's demise and his passing. It wasn't until the following day that they realized the critical mistake that they had made and just how bad it really was. Not only was Carlos alive, but he was also on his deathbed 
giving the authorities a full confession. The San Jose Mercury ran a whole story on him that not only took up the whole front page of the local section, but it also extended for multiple pages and was the first in-depth story about the NF and NR that any local newspaper had ever run. Needless to say, Carlos survived and ended up turning state's evidence against not only sleepers in Lancho, but also against other members and associates of the San Jose Regiment who were all indicted in a superseding indictment. Even though Lentro's role in the attempted murder of Carlos Mejia was minimal and he really only stood by and watched, he was still sentenced to 12 years after pleading guilty. Sleepers on the other hand opted to take it to the box and go to trial. He also could have taken an offer that was on the table by the district attorney of 40 years with no life top, but he rolled the dice and lost. At the time he caught this case, he was still in his early 20s, so he technically could have been out sometime around his early to mid 40s. But that's just the chance you take. After Lencho finished his 12 years, he paroled back to San Jose and began acting like he was some type of high powered NF leader. <laughs> One of his favorite spots was a bar in San Jose called The Place. This is a well known spot that's frequented by a lot of parolees and gang members. Valencio made this his spot. He had everyone and their mother there believing he was some big time shot caller that was running San Jose and that he was some type of prestigious NF leader that had a lot of juice out there on the streets. This is the impression he had everyone under out there. He was always open and real candid when it came to his affiliation with the NF. Valencio took this to another level when it came to civilians. He used his status as leverage and as a means to procure clout on the streets. When I started networking with San Jose and it became necessary for me to work directly with Lancho, this is when I got a first hand look at how he was asserting his influence on the streets. I remember driving out there to meet Lancho numerous times over the years and every time I drove out there he always wanted to go to the place. It was almost repulsive to walk in with this dude and watch how people used to treat him like he was some type of local celebrity. On one occasion, when I drove out there from Salinas with another C named Jaime Rodriguez, aka Smokey, we met Lancho somewhere on the west side. Me and Smokey had just paroled from Corcoran Shoe, and Lancho had just finished up a short violation in San Quentin. But because of high control parole and how it worked, they sent Lancho to Salinas Valley State Prison since it's closer to his residence of parole. When we finally linked up with Lancho that night, he was with one of his boys named David Bermudez, AKA Pookie. And the first thing I noticed about Lancho is that he had what looked like a deep five or six inch scratch on his right cheek. When I asked him about it, he gave me some lame story about being hit by a Nazi lowrider while he was being escorted in Salinas Valley. He told me that when he got to Salinas Valley, he was placed in an overflow section where there wasn't nothing but bulldogs, sureños, dropouts, and Nazi lowriders. He said they had converted a small section of a general population building into an overflow section for ADSEG and others like him who were just passing through for high control parole. He said that this was just supposed to be a temporary overflow section they had converted and that one of the sergeants wanted him moved out of there as soon as an ADSEG cell opened up because they had concerns about cell doors popping open and the gunner making too many mistakes. This was his story. He made it sound good though. He said that on the day he was scheduled to parole, they called his name and told him to pack it up. He was paroling. According to him, he was in that section by himself. There wasn't any other homeboys in there and that he was surrounded by ops. I actually believed him because I had been through Salinas Valley for high control parole myself and they housed me in a similar overflow section when I was there. In fact, the yard they housed me on was a bulldog yard and there wasn't any homeboys out there but me. When they were walking me from R&R &R to the yard I was being housed on, all I could hear was barking by, <laughs> by hundreds of bulldogs. I even asked the COs that were escorting me if they were going to remove my cuffs when they were escorting me just to give me a fighting chance to defend myself if it came down to that. Needless to say, they told me they couldn't do it and I guess the higher powers that be were there with me that day. 
because I walked across that yard and I didn't get rushed. But anyways, I believed most of Lencho's lame ass story because I had been to Salinas Valley myself. The part that didn't make sense was how he supposedly got rushed and sliced while he was under escort. There was just something about it that didn't make sense. But at the time, there was no reason for me to question it, so I believed him and never gave it any more thought. It wasn't until later that I'd end up finding out the real truth about what really happened to him. His dumb ass apparently got played out of pocket and went for the banana in the tailpipe. <laughs> That's what happened. But seriously, this is what I heard happen. While he was there, he was befriended by a known NF dropout named Eddie Fast Eddie Barrios. Eddie shot Lencho cosmetics, some reading material, and whatever else he needed based on the fact that Lencho didn't have nothing and there wasn't any other active homeboys in that section. Up until that point, Lencho did what he was supposed to do. He took advantage of his resources and played along with Fast Eddie's PR game. I would have done the same thing. I would have taken the cosmetics and then slid on back until I was out of there. But here's where Lencho's dumbass fucked up. On the day he paroled, they popped his door open and told him to pack his shit that he was paroling. Lencho packed up what little rat ass property he had and then he put whatever leftover cosmetics and reading material he had in a bag and dropped it off in front of Fast Eddie's door. Up until that point, this dummy's brain was still working. And again, I probably would have done the same thing as that's just proper etiquette. If somebody looks out for you or if they let you check out some literature to read or they loan you something, then you return it when you leave and that's just a respect thing. This even applies with someone like Fast Eddie who's considered a degenerate. PC or not, it wouldn't have mattered to me. But that's just me though. Some people might look at this a little different and they might not extend the same respect back. But I do and that's just the way I've always been. So after Lancho finished packing up and he dropped off everything he had going back to Fast Eddie, he started to walk towards the front gate where one of the floor officers was waiting to strip him out. As he was getting ready to walk up to the front of the section, Fast Eddie called him back over to his door. This is where a red flag should have gone up and where Lancho should have detected that something wasn't right. Lancho was well aware of who Fast Eddie was. He was well aware of the fact that he was a shrewd individual and that he was definitely aware of the fact that Fast Eddie had priors for snaking homeboys. If this dummy ever had spidey senses or that sixth sense that tells some of us that something's not right and that danger's lurking, his had long since dried up and he was open game. <laughs> Fast Eddie on the other hand had a plan all along and he obviously sensed that Lencho was dumb enough to fall for it. When Fast Eddie called Lencho to his door, Lencho skipped right over there clueless and oblivious to what was going on. I'm sure Fast Eddie said something to him that made it seem worthy of coming back to his door for him. But I'm also sure that he purposely made himself sound a little more muffled and harder to hear. Anyone that's been through Salinas Valley should know that the doors are solid and that sometimes it's hard to hear someone talking, whether they're inside or outside of the cell. Sometimes the only way you can hear is to get right up on the crack of the door and put your ear to the crack so you can listen in here. And again, this was Fast Eddie's plan all along. Fast Eddie purposely said something under his breath that Lencho couldn't hear and that instinctively made him put his ear to the crack. And the rest is history. What do you think happened? <laughs> Fast Eddie had a piece of paper rolled up real tight about the size of a straw and then he had a loose razor affixed to the end of it so that he could use it as a slashing instrument. It was the perfect size and shape for sticking it through the crack of his door and slicing a dumb, unsuspecting idiot like Lancho. I can almost imagine it as it happened. Fast Eddie says something Lancho can barely hear. Lancho says, what's that? I can't hear you, bro. Lancho leans in so he can hear better. Then booyah! <laughs> Fast Eddie gets him, pulls back and looks through his window wearing a big ass, you should have known better smile. Once I found out about what really happened and I heard how Lencho got the puto mark across his face, I understood why he lied about it and it all made sense. This guy has an image to maintain. He's always had an image to maintain. 
That's why he's always been a tyrant. I guarantee you that any other C that knew Lancho and knew how he functioned would have nothing but negative things to say about him. They'd either say he was power hungry, he was full of himself, or that he used his status as leverage to get what he wanted. When Lancho would be in Quentin, and other C's would try to get moved up on the tier next to him, it wasn't because they liked him and wanted to be next to him, it was because they wanted to keep an eye on him and they wanted to stay abreast of what he was up to. Every time I was around him in Quentin, he always did something foul or what we, the familia, would have construed as conduct unbecoming. Here's a few things I can remember that all happened at different times. On one occasion, there was a youngster who I believe was from Napa or Vallejo that I had appointed as one of my tier securities. I was grooming this youngster up to be an NR member and I believe I had him on a 90 day probationary period. This was sometime around 98, 99 and I believe we were housed on the upper yard side, the same side the mainline chow halls are on in East Block. On this particular day I'm referring to, we were getting ready to go out to the yard when all of a sudden this individual sent me a kite basically putting me on notice that he was dropping out and that he wasn't feeling it no more. Along with the kite, he also sent me all the razor blades he was holding, all the household tobacco he was given to sell, rosters, and all the other contraband he had been securing as one of my tier securities. I can't say that I've ever supported or approved of the way any homie has ever chosen to lock it up or checked out, but if I ever had a choice to pick how it was done, I'd say I'd rather it be done like this youngster did that morning. Instead of locking up on everything and giving it to the IGI like a lot of other dudes usually do, he gave everything back to the household and then checked out. I don't want to get too far off track, but this happened at a time when so many homeboys were walking away and dropping out that it didn't even surprise me anymore. This became a daily occurrence and it got to the point to where so many homeboys were walking away that it was almost expected. Per protocol, and as a showing of good faith, I sent all the other C's that were there on the tier with me this guy's kite, just so they all knew what was going on, and just because that was the way I always operated. I believe there was three or four other C's on the tier with me, and even though I was the RC, I still kept them privy and abreast of what was taking place amongst the manpower and anything pertinent to the household. I think it was myself, Lencho, Bubba from Salinas, Wino from Salinas, and Caja from San Jose. We were all neighbors on the fourth tier. Anyways, as the wheela circulated amongst them, nobody said nothing until it came to Lencho. All of a sudden, this clown starts J-catting out on the tier, disrespecting the homie that just sent me the kite. He started saying, hey, you piece of shit, you're a bitch, you're nothing but a degenerate, you're a weak motherfucker, etc., etc. I had to jump out on the tier and tell Lancho to stop acting like one of the pesetas on the first tier, that we didn't conduct ourselves like that, that he knows better, etc, etc. He actually got butthurt about it and we stopped communicating for about 3 or 4 days. Like a little broad, he stopped talking to me like he put me on the shine for 3 or 4 days. I don't want to talk to you right now. Long enough for him to come to his senses and realize that he was wrong, then he started talking to me again. During one of the other occasions while we were there at San Quentin together, we bumped heads because I wouldn't acknowledge a filter he was attempting to circulate and I was demanding that he gather more clarity about it before anyone, including him, began filtering it out. This was right around the time when Operation Black Widow broke and we were just finding out who some of the cooperators were. Lencho had one of our death row contacts in East Block call his girl, who at that time was none other than Peggy, so that she could relay any messages she might have had coming back from leadership. At the time, she was visiting Skip, so I never doubted the veracity of the information. However, it was the context I was worried about, especially since it involved a fellow C. The message Peggy sent to us was that someone with the last name of a flower was no good and was cooperating. That, that was it right there. That was the extent of it. Lencho right away assumed that she must have been referring to Chico from Salinas whose last name was Rose. But I wasn't comfortable going on such sparse and meager information and I told him this. 
I've always been the kind of C who makes sure that other C's are afforded their due process and that they're always given the benefit of the doubt. And this situation wasn't no different. I conceded that his assumptions were convincing and that it might in fact be a reference to him. But without something substantial to go on, I just wasn't going to base it on that alone. As usual, Lencho was ready to pounce on Chico and was revving to declare the world that Chico was a piece of shit rat who was cooperating, but I didn't allow it. Again, this situation put us at odds and he was forced to follow up with Peggy to make sure that it was in fact Chico that they were referring to. That's another good example of how Lencho has a habit of jumping the gun. This next situation is yet but another example of Lencho jumping the gun and just how scandalous he was. Before I get into this, let me just say this. When it comes to Skip, I've always respected his judgment and his integrity when it comes to his role as being part of the leadership. I believe for the most part, he's always followed NF law and the constitution. However, when it comes to some of his personal relationships and those who he holds near and dear, I've seen him deviate firsthand and play the favoritism card. Sometime between 98 and 2002, there was a C named George Lucky Mendoza from San Jose that came through Quentin and had just caught his third strike. He had apparently been out of the system for a minute, but while he was out there, he was involved with a woman who went by the name Mommy. Lucky claimed he had been in a serious relationship with her and that they were together for a few years. Nothing wrong with that picture, right? Well, this is where Lucky ran into trouble. One of Skip's closest friends that he had got real tight with on the streets, an individual named Robert Pony Mares, apparently used to be involved in a serious relationship with this same woman, Mommy. And evidently, he still had feelings for her. Pony was doing life in federal prison and had long since been separated from Mommy. I guess Pony caught wind that Mommy was now in a relationship with Lucky and didn't like it. He allegedly sent word to Lucky to leave her alone, but Lucky ignored his threats and continued to see her. I would have done the same thing. Just because Pony was with her doesn't mean he has some type of lifelong hold on her, nor does it bar her from moving on in life either. So in turn, Pony got at Skip and asked Skip if he could take care of it for him. Contrary to the facts and contrary to what's right and wrong, Skip showed favoritism to Pony and began pushing for Lucky's removal. At the time all this was going on, I was the RC over San Quentin and any and all final decisions to have anyone hit had to go through me. As soon as I was able to gather all the facts about this, I conducted a thorough investigation and kept stalling time when it came to hitting Lucky. After gathering all the facts, I concluded that this was clearly a case of favoritism and that this was a bad call. I basically put my own neck on the line and refused to hit Lucky because I knew it was wrong. Even though Skip was in a higher leadership position than me, and even though he had more status than me, I was following the way I had been schooled and I was following the Constitution. I was always taught that if you followed the Constitution and NF law to the T, that you could never go wrong and that you'd always have the backing of the O. <laughs> I'd also find out later that that was wrong, but that's how I always operated. So this is what I was relying on. I refused to have Lucky hit despite being pressed by Lencho and despite hearing him whine about how this would have an adverse effect on him as well. But I reminded Lencho that I was solely responsible for rescinding the green light and that I'd personally take full responsibility for it. I even went as far as telling Lucky that as long as I was there that I wouldn't allow anything to happen to him based on the fact that it was a frivolous call and that it was all based on favoritism. But I was also honest with him. I told him that as long as I was there, nothing would happen to him and that I had his back. However, I also let him know that I couldn't promise him that the other C's would honor this once I left and that he should stay on his toes. While I was there and before I finally caught a bus to Corcoran, Skip continued to push the issue and at one point got upset and demanded that Lucky be hit. I believe he said something to the effect of, why hasn't that been handled? 
No one should have to hold anyone's hand to make sure that this gets done. Take care of it and get rid of that dude. Again, I refuse to comply with his directives as I always stood up for what I believe was right and I always hoped that others would do the same if it ever came to me. <laughs> hold my breath for that one. It wasn't that I was just carefree about defying a directive coming from Skip. It wasn't about that. What it was about was giving this brother his due process and doing what I knew was right. Hearing Lentrell cry about why I was refusing a directive coming from Skip was the least of my worries. I had gotten used to hearing him snivel about one thing or another, but this situation created more tension and animosity between us. Eventually, I ended up getting transferred out to Corcoran, and it wasn't even a full week before I left before Lancho had two NR members, Tops from Vallejo and Willow from San Jose hit Lucky. But this was even done in classic Lancho fashion. This scandalous dude made sure that he was on a visit when Lucky was being hit because he didn't want to be out there on the yard when it went down. <laughs> the one thing I can say about Lencho is that he's put plenty of green lights on ends before in the past, but when it comes to putting in work himself, it's crickets. He's done nothing himself. Even when it's come to some of the drama that we've gotten into on the streets, Lencho was never known to be someone who'd have your back or who would regulate when it was time. You guys all heard the story about the dude I knocked out at that 7-Eleven and how all Lencho did was cry about how the camera seen us and that we were both going to get violated since we were on parole. That was just one of many situations that I personally encountered with him. One time myself and Smokey from Salinas drove out to San Jose to meet Lencho and to drop off some dope I was supplying the San Jose regiment with. This was when I was functioning with the Salinas regiment and was networking with San Jose, Watsonville, and San Francisco. Since we came out to San Jose and we were meeting up with this corn dog, we of course ended up at the place, the one spot in San Jose where Lancho was made to feel like he's a king. During that meetup, we ended up getting into it with some youngsters behind something that happened over the pool table between one of Lancho's boys and one of the other guys that was there. These guys, weren't even what I would consider to be Northaniels. They were more like disco ducks or flyby nights. Guys that wear angel flight skinny jeans and who get all made up with hair gel and moose for the club. Anyways, when everything jumped off, there was only about four of them dudes that were there by the pool table trying to get loud with Lentil's homeboy. But as soon as we all started fighting, four or five more of them dudes came from by the bar area and the fight was on. Smokey was the first one to kick it off as I remember seeing him sock the main big mouth that was doing all the talking. After that it was a free for all. At one point I looked over at Smokey and seen that we were both fighting two of these dudes each because they had the numbers. Besides me and Smokey, the only other ones to get off that night was Lentro's homeboy and another guy who was just there at the bar drinking and who just seen what was happening. Later we find out that he was a homeboy who had done time with Lencho's little brother Greg and as a result knew who Lencho was. That really didn't come as a surprise because most if not everyone who goes to that bar is either on parole or they've done time somewhere. When it was over me and Smokey jumped in his ride and jumped back on the freeway to Salinas because there was no doubt in my mind that somebody had called the cops. Later, when Lencho was asked why he didn't get involved, he swore up and down that he did and that he was fighting two more of them dudes by the back door on 2nd Street. This was a blatant lie. I seen Lencho the whole time we were fighting, and he never left the bar area. <laughs> but this was classic Lencho. I could recite a few more instances where he did the same thing, but it's not necessary. He cried and whined about that one incident I had at that 7-Eleven that I told you guys about in the past. He didn't assist sleepers when sleepers hit Carlos Mejia and I've never heard about Lencho ever putting in any work behind the walls. Then there's the incident that I recited in my book where this scandalous dude sat back and let me take the blame for an ounce of dope that Peggy, his girl at the time, supposedly gave me. He did this knowing that I didn't have nothing to do with it. He knew Smokey was the one who picked it up, but yet he chose not to speak up because it served a bigger purpose for him at that time. 
keeping me on freeze meant that I couldn't exercise any authority while I was there and that I'd basically be powerless to stop him whenever he tried pulling some of the scandalous moves like he did with the tobacco. Remember the tobacco story I told you guys? How Lancho took advantage of all the homies over there? That's the kind of shit he does. How Lancho skirted through all these years without ever putting in any work and operating the way he has is something I don't even have the answer for myself. I honestly believe that just his mere involvement as a co-defendant in the attempted murder on Carlos Mejia is what carried him through and that this has continued to be his saving grace. But the beginning of the end was finally approaching. On March 8, 2007, Lentil, along with his two co-defendants, were arrested and were placed in custody at the Santa Clara County Jail. Initially, he came in on a case that charged him, Frank Ruiz, and another C by the name of Marco Abundis with conspiracy to distribute methamphetamine and gang enhancements. The case involved the CI who agreed to wear a wire and set these three individuals up. I'm not going to go into the details of the case as I'm going to respect the privacy of the parties who were involved. You guys already know how I am when it comes to transparency, but I just feel like it's this individual's place to speak on it if they choose to do so. At any rate, as Lentra was sitting in the county jail fighting this first case, law enforcement was actively building the other case that would ultimately get him stretched out and put on the shelf. They started by conducting a search warrant on his house where his wife Debbie Corrales was living with her teenage son and her other small kids. After conducting the search, these officers, who were all part of the initial case against him, began pressuring his wife Debbie to basically either face being indicted herself or to assist them in their subsequent investigation of Lentrum's regimen. Needless to say, after applying a little bit of pressure and threatening to have her kids placed in foster care, Debbie agreed to assist them and became instrumental in bringing down not only Lentrum's regimen, but also two other active regiments in San Jose that were being overseen by Sammy Wino Ramirez from San Jose and Charlie, Charlie Brown Campa from Hollister. After Debbie agreed to assist with the investigation, she gave a detailed description about how she met Lencho as well as what it was like being married to him. According to Debbie, she met Lencho at a ranch for juveniles when she was 14 years old. Lencho was a year or two younger at the time. She claimed that she lost contact with Lencho after their incarceration at this juvenile ranch until sometime around 2005. Shortly after their so-called reunion, Debbie said that Lancho just took it upon himself to move in. What a fucking bum. She said he moved in despite the fact that she told him that he was moving too fast and that she wanted to make sure her kids were receptive to him first. <laughs> this fucking sleaze bag just packs up his little rat ass property and just moves into her house without asking her. That ain't a bum, I don't know what he is, man. Little by little, this dirt bag moved his stuff in until he was living there. Debbie went on to say that Lancho was always real open with her when it came to NF business, and he told her all about his drug dealing, who was involved, and how he orchestrated it. This is how Debbie learned all the names of all the players who were involved in all three of these regiments. But Lancho went above and beyond what is known as pillow talking with the wife or girlfriend. This is something that is strongly forbidden by the NF and it is one of the biggest forms of breach in security that happens with common regularity. Lencho not only violated this security caveat by exposing Debbie to pillow talk, but he took it a step further by actually bringing Debbie to NF functions. NF meetings that are normally just held by NF members or those privy to it because they're part of the regiment. According to Debbie, Lencho would bring her to the meetings and have her sit on his lap as they discussed NF business. I heard about him doing this from some of the other C's and NR members that were indicted. The sole purpose for this was just so Lencho could impress Debbie with his status and so she could see firsthand that he held status within the familia. That's all he was doing. It was self-serving for his own ego and to make himself appear as if he was this big shot caller for the NF. Ooh, look at me. I hold some sway within the NF. 
See, everything I've been telling you is true. Some of the other seeds who were present at some of these meetings had even voiced their disapproval and told Lenchel they weren't comfortable having her there. But he emphatically insisted that she be present, alluding to the fact that he trusted her with his life and that she was an extension of him. <laughs> I heard the fuck out of that. Talk about dropping the ball and putting all your faith into the wrong person. I honestly think that his better judgment had long since went out the window. He was just trying to impress her and keep her believing that he was this big time shot caller so that she'd stay with him. I think he would have went to any degree to prove this to her because the one other thing I can personally attest to about Lancho is that he hasn't exactly done too well for himself when it's come to women. I'm not going to get into all the times we went out with this cat, but there were times when we did go out and Lancho always ended up being that fifth wheel or the one who was always left by himself. I'm dead serious. There were times when we'd meet females out there and I would have to get at one of them and tell her, hey, just kick it with my homeboy. He's a good dude and he likes you, but he just don't know how to approach you. I did this because nobody wanted to be with him. He had no game for himself and his idea of conversation was usually about prison or something lame. So I believe that when Lancho got with Debbie, he was playing for keeps and he was just committed to doing whatever it took to impress her. The other thing he did in an effort to win her over was to use her weakness against her. She had stopped smoking PCP years ago when she was younger and she had cleaned up for her kids. But Lancho got her back on that shit and even started smoking it with her. In fact, Debbie was the one who told the cops that story about Lancho getting all whacked out on PCP one night and jumping from one couch to the other couch yelling, I am the general, I am the general. <laughs> I think he was, if I remember right, I think he was even beating his chest like a fucking silverback when he was saying that shit. That was her story. I just sensationalized it. <laughs> Laugh out loud. What an idiot. Even though this clown was high, it still gives you an inside look into how he thinks and what his dumb ass was doing out there. Anyways, thanks to Debbie and compliments of Lancho, the prosecution had a total of 30 recorded telephone calls and dozens of recorded conversations that Debbie had targeting all the people who were either part of one of these three regiments or who were associated with them in some way. The cops gave Debbie a recording device and then they gave her a list of all the people they had an interest in. One by one, she went down the list and got them all caught up. And most of these guys felt somewhat comfortable talking to Debbie because Lentro rubber stamped her and told them they could trust her. He was the conduit that most of them trusted and because of this, some of them even felt a level of obligation based on Lencho's status and just him being a C. Most of the conversations centered around drugs and were enough to get everybody spun up in a big drug conspiracy case. But she managed to get Lencho second in command to admit to a murder and that was the smoking gun. Clayton Shorty Clark from Westside Gardens admitted to shooting two Southsiders that ran up into his house and tried to shoot him. One of these dudes was apparently his old lady's ex, so there was more to it than just the north-south conflict, like Debbie had assumed. Coincidentally, the ex was the one that died. The other one was also shot, but he survived. But even though Debbie helped set this guy up, he later decided to cooperate against Lecho, and the DA agreed to let him off on a self-defense plea. <laughs> Crazy how shit works out. Aside from all the damage that Debbie was able to inflict, Lancho did his part to make sure that every last individual that was either functioning under him or associated with him was also indicted and brought in on these cases by either calling them on the jail phone or having someone else call for him. I outlined all this in my book, but this is how Lancho practically got the whole tier indicted for making his phone calls or for getting them to incriminate themselves on the phone. On April 23, 2009, all of Lencho's malfeasance finally came to a head and he was indicted with 25 other members and associates of his regiment. Debbie's tapes and Lencho's phone calls were the centerpiece or the basis of the entire case. And despite the fact that he got all these guys caught up, 
or that his wife got them caught up as a result of the trust they put into her because of him, he still continued to do scandalous shit while he was waiting to go to trial. One of the homies that got caught up for assisting Lencho was a good homeboy named Danny Chinito Castillo from BES. This guy got caught up for assisting Lencho's dumbass. But here's how scandalous this dude is. At some point, Lencho becomes aware of the fact that Chinito's sitting on $25,000 and that he has this tucked away out there somewhere. This is Chinito's money. It's not NF money. It has no connection to any NF business or anything like that. But Lencho finds out about it and basically tries to strong arm Chinito using his status as leverage. He went as far as threatening to deem Chinito if he didn't let him borrow that money. <laughs> Lencho said he needed it to pay for his attorney. That's it. That's all. That's a clear form of using this status for his own personal gain. Another form of conduct unbecoming. Unfortunately, Lencho's dilemmas aren't anybody else's problems but his own. You can't go around trying to strong arm the little homies out of their money simply because you need money to pay for your attorney. <laughs> he should have been placed on freeze and relieved of his position at that point. But unfortunately, there was nobody else there to keep Lencho in check. That's why he was running around doing this type of faulty shit and not worrying about someone reporting him. If he would have been relieved of his position, a lot of shit wouldn't have happened and he wouldn't have been allowed to stick his nose in my situation either. But karma ended up getting the best of Lencho in the end and he was reciprocated in a number of different ways. If it wasn't bad enough that his own wife turned on him and testified against him at trial, his only biological son also turned state's evidence and threw him under the bus. I think the funniest part about what happened to Lencho was what happened when his wife Debbie had just finished setting everyone up and the cops went to her house with moving trucks in the middle of the night and moved her. Lencho had no idea. He thought everything was still good with her, but he finds out when he calls his sister Stephanie. The call is hilarious and I'm working on getting it so I can drop it for you guys. In this particular call, Lencho calls his sister Stephanie and he's all happy telling her how Debbie finally got cleared to visit him and that they can't deny her from visiting him anymore, etc, etc. Lencho goes on and on about other shit that's happening in the jail while Stephanie continues trying to tell him something that he's obviously too stupid to understand. She tells him between the lines that Debbie is gone, she's not on your team anymore and that he needs to just worry about himself. But Lencho still doesn't catch it. She tries to tell him over and over, but he's just not catching it. Finally, Stephanie gets upset and says, Listen, Debbie is gone. The cops that arrested you went by her house in the middle of the night with big ass moving trucks and moved her away somewhere. She's probably on the other side of the country somewhere in the witness protection program. Finally, this dummy understands and asks Stephanie what she's talking about. Again, Stephanie repeats herself and tells him everything's gone. The house is empty. They packed her up and moved her across state lines somewhere. Once it really starts sinking in, Lancho says, and he says it like a big dummy in, in, in the stupidest way. She took my bike too. Fuck. I had about 20 pairs of Jordans. She took everything I own. I don't, I don't even own a pair of socks. <laughs> like I said, the call is hilarious. You have to hear it to appreciate how stupid Lancho sounds. And you can just hear his mind working once he realizes the gravity and the seriousness of what's happening. Needless to say, Lencho got wiped out at trial and ended up getting sentenced to 40 years and 4 months. Unless some of the three strike laws that were revised apply to him, he has to do 80% of his time since he was doubled up on his second strike. For his sake, hopefully it will apply, because even though I can't stand the dude, and still want to inflict some punishment on his world, I don't wish prison on anybody, not even my worst enemy. But Lencho's bad luck continued to follow him even after he was sentenced and shipped off to prison. While he was still at the jail awaiting sentencing, he managed to get the mother load of Glavos smuggled into the jail so that he'd be set once he got to the joint. He had about an ounce of crystal, a couple grams of PCP, a couple grams of carga, 
some yeska, about two pouches of tobacco, a lighter, some razor blades, and whatever else he had stuffed in that softball sized bag of glavo he had hooped. I actually almost felt sorry for the dude when I heard about him getting caught with it. Just imagine his state of mind. He just got slapped with a 40 year sentence, but leaving the county jail with a glavo like this even made that seem a little bit better. Even if it was just temporary. In his mind, he had to be thinking, damn, I'm gonna be famous when I hit Quinn, and I ain't gonna be wanting for nothing. I'm gonna get everything I need as soon as I get there. But then, he pulls up to San Quentin and the first thing they do is pull him aside, tape up the legs at the bottom of his jumpsuit, put tape around his waist, and then they put tape around his sleeves. They do this so you can't get nothing out of your jumpsuit if they suspect you of having something hooped. Then they put shackles and waist chains on you. They lock you up in a small cage and then at some point they tell you that you are now officially on potty watch. <laughs> That's what they did to that dummy, probably because he was bragging about what he had or told the wrong person about his business. I've never been on potty watch myself, but I knew a lot of homeboys who went through it and they said it was fucked up. While you're standing there in this small cage taped up, they have an officer sitting right there outside the cage at all times watching you and basically waiting for you to shit on yourself. They make you shit on yourself too. It's not like they say, okay, I give up. I'm ready to go. Just take it. They make you shit in your jumpsuit and then they cut it open and retrieve the contraband. Talk about having your bubble busted. There's no doubt in my mind that this had to kill his spirits, especially when you know he thought he was going to be doing big things in Queen. But his downward spiral wasn't over yet. After all the chaos and damage this fool caused, he had to have known that he was going to be held to answer for it. Maybe he was just delaying the inevitable because he didn't lock it up right away. He waited until he was transferred out. I think he held off until the homies tried to give him a celly. After that, he couldn't buy it any more time. So he's now on an SMY, PC'd up. His ex-wife is in the witness protection program, supposedly with one of his old homeboys she shacked up with, and she took his Harley and gave it to this guy. His younger brother, Greg Guzman, also locked it up and dropped out. And his son, Danny Guzman, is out and doesn't have any contact with Lencho. If that ain't a dysfunctional family, then I don't know what is. I hope you guys enjoyed this episode of Paradigm Profiles. The next one I'll be dropping is about Tibbs and his untimely demise. So be looking for that to drop sometime next week. Also, as I previously mentioned, I spoke to Baby Joker from Watsonville this past Saturday. And he agreed to do a full interview and discuss some things about the state and federal factions that you're only going to hear right here exclusively on Paradigm Media News. That interview will take place next weekend, so it'll drop next Monday or Tuesday at the latest. Thank you all for the support you've been giving us, and we're almost at a thousand subs on our other channel. Help us out by subbing if you haven't done so already. It's Paradigm Entertainment Productions. We want to get this channel up and running so we can drop more content and explore some other ideas we have in mind. So be sure to sub to that channel for us ASAP. We only need 53 more subs to reach a thousand.